theory of optics. Two major theories on vision prevailed in classical antiquity. The first theory, the emission theory, was supported by such thinkers as Euclid and Ptolemy, who believed that sight worked by the eye emitting rays of light. The second theory, the intromission theory supported by Aristotle and his followers, had physical forms entering the eye from an object. Previous Islamic writers, such as Al-Kindi, had argued essentially on Euclidean, Galenist, or Aristotelian lines. The strongest influence on the book of optics was from Ptolemy Optics, while the description of the anatomy and physiology of the eye was based on Galen's account. Alhazen's achievement was to come up with a theory that successfully combined parts of the mathematical ray arguments of Euclid, the medical tradition of Galen, and the intromission theories of Aristotle. Alhazen's intromission theory followed Al-Kindi, and broke with Aristotle, in asserting that from each point of every colored body, illuminated by any light, issue light and color along every straight line that can be drawn from that point. This however left him with the problem of explaining how a coherent image was formed from many independent sources of radiation. In particular, every point of an object would send rays to every point on the eye. What Alhazen needed was for each point on an object to correspond to one point only on the eye. He attempted to resolve this by asserting that the eye would only perceive perpendicular rays from the object, for any one point on the eye, only the ray that reached it directly, without being refracted by any other part of the eye, would be perceived. He argued, using a physical analogy, that perpendicular rays were stronger than oblique rays. In the same way that a ball thrown directly at a board might break the board, whereas a ball thrown obliquely at the board would glance off, perpendicular rays were stronger than refracted rays. And it was only perpendicular rays which were perceived by the eye. As there was only one perpendicular ray that would enter the eye at any one point, and all these rays would converge on the center of the eye in a cone, this allowed him to resolve the problem of each point on an object sending many rays to the eye. If only the perpendicular ray mattered, then he had a one-to-one -one correspondence and the confusion could be resolved. He later asserted, in Book 7 of the Optics, that other rays would be refracted through the eye and perceived as if perpendicular. His arguments regarding perpendicular rays do not clearly explain why only perpendicular rays were perceived. Why would the weaker oblique rays not be perceived more weakly? His later argument that refracted rays would be perceived as if perpendicular does not seem persuasive. However, despite its weaknesses, no other theory of the time was so comprehensive. And it was enormously influential, particularly in Western Europe. Directly or indirectly, his De Aspectibus, Book of Optics, inspired much activity in optics between the 13th and 17th centuries. Kepler's later theory of the retinal image, which resolved the problem of the correspondence of points on an object and points in the eye, built directly on the conceptual framework of Alhazen. Alhazen showed through experiment that light travels in straight lines, and carried out various experiments with lenses, mirrors, refraction, and reflection. His analyses of reflection and refraction considered the vertical and horizontal components of light rays separately. The camera obscura was known to the ancient Chinese and was described by the Han Chinese polymathic genius Shen Kuo in his scientific book Dream Pool Essays, published in the year 1088 CE. Aristotle had discussed the basic principle behind it in his problems, but Alhazen's work also contained the first clear description, outside of China, of camera obscura in the areas of the Middle East, Europe, Africa and India and early analysis of the device. Alhazen used a camera obscura to observe a partial solar eclipse. In his essay, On the Form of the Eclipse, he writes that he observed the sickle-like shape of the sun at the time of an eclipse.
The introduction to his essay reads as follows. The image of the sun at the time of the eclipse, unless it is total, demonstrates that when its light passes through a narrow round hole and is cast on a plane opposite to the hole it takes on the form of a moonsicle. His findings solidified the importance in the history of the camera obscura. Alhazen studied the process of sight, the structure of the eye, image formation in the eye, and the visual system. E.N.P. Howard argued in a 1996 Perception article that Alhazen should be credited with many discoveries and theories previously attributed to Western Europeans writing centuries later. For example, he described what became in the 19th century Herring's Law of Equal Innervation. He wrote a description of vertical horopters 600 years before Agulonius that is actually closer to the modern definition than Agulonius's, and his work on binocular disparity was repeated by Panem in 1858. Craig A. and Stockdale, while agreeing that Alhazen should be credited with many advances, has expressed some caution, especially when considering Alhazen and isolation from Ptolemy with whom Alhazen was extremely familiar. Alhazen corrected a significant error of Ptolemy regarding binocular vision, but otherwise his account is very similar. Ptolemy also attempted to explain what is now called Herring's Law. In general, Alhazen built on and expanded the optics of Ptolemy. In a more detailed account of Ibn al-Haytham's contribution to the study of binocular vision based on Lejeune and Sabra, Reno showed that the concepts of correspondence, homonymous and cross-diplopia were in place in Ibn al-Haytham's optics. But contrary to Howard, he explained why Ibn al-Haytham did not give the circular figure of the horopter and why. By reasoning experimentally, he was in fact closer to the discovery of Panem's fusional area than that of the Vyath Muller circle. In this regard, Ibn al Haytham's theory of binocular vision faced two main limits the lack of recognition of the role of the retina, and obviously the lack of an experimental investigation of ocular tracts. Al Hazan's most original contribution was that, after describing how he thought the eye was anatomically constructed, he went on to consider how this anatomy would behave functionally as an optical system. His understanding of pinhole projection from his experiments appears to have influenced his consideration of image inversion in the eye, which he sought to avoid. He maintained that the rays that fell perpendicularly on the lens, or glacial humor as he called it, were further refracted outward as they left the glacial humor and the resulting image thus passed upright into the optic nerve at the back of the eye. He followed Galen in believing that the lens was the receptive organ of sight, although some of his work hints that he thought the retina was also involved. Alhazen's synthesis of light and vision adhered to the Aristotelian scheme, exhaustively describing the process of vision in a logical, complete fashion. Scientific method. The duty of the man who investigates the writings of scientists, if learning the truth is his goal, is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads, and attack it from every side. He should also suspect himself as he performs his critical examination of it, so that he may avoid falling into either prejudice or leniency. Alhazen An aspect associated with Alhazen's optical research is related to systemic and methodological reliance on experimentation, itibar, Arabic and controlled testing in his scientific inquiries. Moreover, his experimental directives rested on combining classical physics, ilm tabi, with mathematics, ta'alim, geometry in particular. This mathematical-physical approach to experimental science supported most of his propositions in Kitab al-Manazir, the optics, the aspectibus or perspective a, and grounded his theories of vision light and color, as well as his research in catoptrics and dioptrics, the study of the reflection and refraction of light, respectively. According to Matthias Schramm, 
Alhazen, was the first to make a systematic use of the method of varying the experimental conditions in a constant and uniform manner. In an experiment showing that the intensity of the light spot formed by the projection of the moonlight through two small apertures onto a screen diminishes constantly as one of the apertures is gradually blocked up. G. J. Toomer expressed some skepticism regarding Schramm's view, partly because at the time the Book of Optics had not yet been fully translated from Arabic. And Toomer was concerned that without context, specific passages might be read anachronistically. While acknowledging Alhazen's importance in developing experimental techniques, Toomer argued that Alhazen should not be considered in isolation from other Islamic and ancient thinkers. Toomer concluded his review by saying that it would not be possible to assess Schramm's claim that Ibn al-Haytham was the true founder of modern physics without translating more of Alhazen's work and fully investigating his influence on later medieval writers. Alhazen's Problem His work on Catoptrix in Book 5 of the Book of Optics contains a discussion of what is now known as Alhazen's Problem, first formulated by Ptolemy in 150 AD. It comprises drawing lines from two points in the plane of a circle meeting at a point on the circumference and making equal angles with the normal at that point. This is equivalent to finding the point on the edge of a circular billiard table at which a player must aim a cue ball at a given point to make it bounce off the table edge and hit another ball at a second given point. Thus, its main application in optics is to solve the problem, given a light source and a spherical mirror. Find the point on the mirror where the light will be reflected to the eye of an observer. This leads to an equation of the fourth degree. This eventually led Alhazen to derive a formula for the sum of fourth powers, where previously only the formulas for the sums of squares and cubes had been stated. His method can be readily generalized to find the formula for the sum of any integral powers. Although he did not himself do this, perhaps because he only needed the fourth power to calculate the volume of the paraboloid he was interested in. He used his result on sums of integral powers to perform what would now be called an integration. Where the formulas for the sums of integral squares and fourth powers allowed him to calculate the volume of a paraboloid. Alhazen eventually solved the problem using conic sections and a geometric proof. His solution was extremely long and complicated and may not have been understood by mathematicians reading him in Latin translation. Later mathematicians used Descartes' analytical methods to analyze the problem. An algebraic solution to the problem was finally found in 1965 by Jack M. Ilkin, an actuarian. Other solutions were discovered in 1989, by Harold Reed and in 1997 by the Oxford mathematician Peter M. Newman. Recently, Mitsubishi Electric Research Laboratories, Merle, researchers solved the extension of Alhazen's problem to general rotationally symmetric quadric mirrors including hyperbolic, parabolic and elliptical mirrors. Other Contributions The Kitab al-Manazir, Book of Optics, describes several experimental observations that Alhazen made and how he used his results to explain certain optical phenomena using mechanical analogies. He conducted experiments with projectiles and concluded that only the impact of perpendicular projectiles on surfaces was forceful enough to make them penetrate. Whereas surfaces tended to deflect oblique projectile strikes. For example, to explain refraction from a rare to a dense medium. He used the mechanical analogy of an iron ball thrown at a thin slate covering a wide hole in a metal sheet. A perpendicular throw breaks the slate and passes through, whereas an oblique one with equal force and from an equal distance does not. He also used this result to explain how intense, direct light hurts the eye, using a mechanical analogy. Alhazen associated strong lights with perpendicular rays and weak lights with oblique ones.
The obvious answer to the problem of multiple rays and the eye was in the choice of the perpendicular ray, since only one such ray from each point on the surface of the object could penetrate the eye. Sudanese psychologist Omar Khalifa has argued that Alhazen should be considered the founder of experimental psychology. For his pioneering work on the psychology of visual perception and optical illusions, Khalifa has also argued that Alhazen should also be considered the founder of psychophysics, a sub discipline and precursor to modern psychology. 96. Although Alhazen made many subjective reports regarding vision, there is no evidence that he used quantitative psychophysical techniques and the claim has been rebuffed. Alhazen offered an explanation of the moon illusion, an illusion that played an important role in the scientific tradition of medieval Europe. Many authors repeated explanations that attempted to solve the problem of the moon appearing larger near the horizon than it does when higher up in the sky. Alhazen argued against Ptolemy refraction theory, and defined the problem in terms of perceived, rather than real, enlargement. He said that judging the distance of an object depends on there being an uninterrupted sequence of intervening bodies between the object and the observer. When the moon is high in the sky there are no intervening objects, so the moon appears close. The perceived size of an object of constant angular size varies with its perceived distance. Therefore, the moon appears closer and smaller high in the sky, and further and larger on the horizon. Through works by Roger Bacon, John Petcham and Whitello based on Alhazen's explanation. The moon illusion gradually came to be accepted as a psychological phenomenon, with the refraction theory being rejected in the 17th century. Although Alhazen is often credited with the perceived distance explanation, he was not the first author to offer it. Cleomedes, circa 2nd century, gave this account, in addition to refraction. And he credited it to Posidonius, circa 135 to 50 BCE. Ptolemy may also have offered this explanation in his optics, but the text is obscure. Alhazen's writings were more widely available in the Middle Ages than those of these earlier authors, and that probably explains why Alhazen received the credit.